Aloha, my friends. Thank you for joining me with the Think Tech Hawaii program uh, coming to you from Honolulu. This is a virtual background, but some places in Hawaii looks just like this. So, so I hope to crash your uh, crash into your snow laden world with a, a beautiful look at Hawaii and the and, uh, wonderful things that we have here. I'm Larry Grimm and I do my program, Don't Just Age, Engage, every two weeks here on Think Tech Hawaii. Most Think Tech Hawaii programs deal with a lot of very important uh, concerns, issue concerns, looking at social issues and responding to them. And we have a wonderful range of social issue programs. My program, Don't Just Age, Engage, comes out of my coaching for people uh, uh, who are entering their elderhood or in their elderhood and want to make it extraordinary. Uh, my website, which is Personal Coaching for Life and Faith, there we are. When, check it out on my website, please. And um, connect with me if you like, and let's get a conversation going about how your aging process is going. Because we live in a society that really doesn't like aging. It kind of almost hates aging. And it certainly feels a culture that fears dying. So I am in the business of making that uh, the time of your life the most extraordinary and ex excellent time it can be, being, coming alongside you and being an assistant and making the goals, that, reaching the goals that you have about aging. My, uh, my coaching is informational and it is emotional. And in the emotional dimension, I like to give you pictures and views of, that are inspiring. And uh, what better inspiration than people who have lived and are living extraordinary lives and extraordinary elderhood. Joseph Umstead, longtime friend of mine living in Virginia, is one of those people. Hello, Joseph. Thank you for coming on and being, a, being here as an extraordinary example of an extraordinary elderhood. Thanks, Larry, for having me uh, again. This time, I'm talking about a completely different subject than climate change. Mm -hmm. Although what we are talking about, I think, does tonight does does relate to that that very interesting um, issue. So I've entitled this from crisis to composing, and uh, the reason is because I know you had several years ago a medical crisis. So did you nearly die? Uh, yes, I did. Um, so I had just returned um, from my 40th uh, college reunion in the Boston, Massachusetts area in mid-October of 2018. And my spouse, Diane, uh, took a plane from Boston to Los Angeles for a business trip. So on the 18th of um, October, I I woke up twice, and the second time I said, there's something going on here. I was having a lot of trouble breathing, particularly from the diaphragm, and I'm very sensitive about my diaphragm since I've been playing the trumpet for 59 years. So I drove myself to the only hospital I knew about, um, which was several miles down the road, a Catholic hospital here in Newport News, Virginia, where I live, and they told me the very next day, had I not driven myself in on the 18th, I probably would have died. Uh, because of what ensued after that. It was a very, very serious uh, heart incident then that you had to deal with, and that became a, kind of a transformative moment for you. Tell us, tell us about how you handled that. What happened in that crisis to you, uh, for you, Joseph? <laughs> well, first of all, they had trouble figuring out what was going on. Um, initially, um, they thought it was something with my lungs, and in fact it was, uh, because my mitral valve, um, which opens to allow uh, blood to come back in through, uh, as it passes through the lungs, uh, was not functioning. And in fact, the foundation that was holding the uh, micro, uh, uh, mitral valve in place had um, torn or ripped in several places. It usually happens when you have a, a heart attack, or can happen when you have a heart attack, but I had, had no heart attack. So um, um, it took them actually about a day and a half to figure out that it was my mitral valve, 
that was the problem. And I think I must have had like four heart echoes that determined this. Um, and so um, I, I, a few days after uh, that diagnosis and two uh, procedures, a heart catheterization and then a camera going down my throat to uh, really get a close look at everything heart related, particularly the mitral valve. Um, I was shipped off to one of the best hospitals on the East Coast for heart surgery, Norfolk um, Heart Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia. And um, on Halloween, <laughs> Halloween, I was supposed to be on Halloween at uh, an orchestra engagement for the orchestra that I do volunteer education work, Symphonicity. But uh, I was uh, uh, being cut open um, to a mitral valve replaced by a pig valve. And, it was a tricky surgery um, because, um, well, first of all, I want to say I requested of the heart surgeon that he play a box uh, um, cello suites and Oyo Ma would be the uh, soloist. And he actually liked the idea, even though he was going to put on his rock music to Led Zeppelin because he had a whole <laughs> mapped up process of where he needed to be in the surgery by a certain point. Um, so it turns out that one of his accompanying uh, uh, surgeons was a cellist, and they didn't, he didn't know that. Um, they never had that opportunity to talk about that. So it was a good moment for them to hear some good music. And I think sort of unconsciously it, it relaxed me because it's a piece of music I listen to many times before I go to bed. So um, the surgery itself was about seven and a half hours long, and when they went to start my heart, it wouldn't start. The electrical system was 100% blocked, so they had to put a temporary pacemaker in, and they got it going. Um, and then a couple hours later, one of the lines in the pacemaker failed. That's when they got really nervous um, and wondered if they'd be able to, to save me. Yeah. Double. So, um, fortunately... Yes, fortunately, they, they got me going, and a couple hours later, they took the tube out, and I was breathing on my own and asking for ice chips all night. And the next day, um, they turned the pacemaker off to see if I would actually be able to um, pace on my own, and I couldn't. It immediately went to a low number, a heart failure number. So a couple hours later, they um, took back into surgery and put a pacemaker in, and then I, then I began to recover. Um, but it wasn't an easy recovery, and we can talk about that more. But I'll stop there for the moment. I recall, well, thank you so much for sharing that. I recall a couple of <clears throat> conversations um, that I had with you afterwards. And, and uh, typically, if I, if I may say typically, um, you manifested some of that depression and fear and anxiety that goes along with heart events like this. Um, heart, uh, heart attacks, heart problems, heart disease can really s throw people into a downward spin. And I thought I was experiencing some of that with you. Mm. Is that right? Um, part of what you were experiencing with me early on, because you and I did talk a few days after the surgery, um, was what they call a pump head. Since I was on a heart-lung machine for a number of hours, um, <laughs> it does really mess with your brain uh, once you're not on it. Um, and, of course, I had been off of morphine for a couple of days. But, yes, anxiety was part of the equation. Now, I do want to add um, quickly that there were there was there was there were different people who were present to me during my surgery. So um, when I woke up, my aunt, my spouse asked me, "Well, who was there with you?" And I said, "Well, my mother Evangeline was holding me from the waist up. My father Claire was holding me from the waist down, and both of them um, were were well. You know, died a long time ago." And my grandfather, Donald, who I never met, he died uh, three months before I was born. So I was present and felt my mother's grief at his funeral and, you know, uh, months after. Uh, but he was sort of standing in the background just supporting me. And only two people spoke to me. 
Um, and somebody might be saying only two people. I didn't know anybody could. But so my experience was Jesus came in as a court jester. And Jesus, Joseph, you need to let go of some of that old anxiety when you wake up. So there was an assurance that I was going to wake up and keep going. So I did start working in therapy on that anxiety, which, you know, been present in different traumatic moments in my life. The other person that spoke to me was Martin Luther King Jr. And he said, Joseph, I know you've been to my house in uh, Georgia in Atlanta, because I had been with my daughter and her boyfriend at the time. And we, um, we had a really nice tour of the house and we learned from the tour guide that uh, Martin was actually always wanting to be a baseball player and uh, play in, in, at that point in the Negro League. But I think he had um, aspirations if, if there was a chance to play in the big leagues, he wanted to do that. But when he went to first grade, he was no longer allowed to play with his friend across the street, and um, who was a white um, a friend. And it was at the grocery store where the family did continue to shop it because they went to two different schools. The father said, you can't play with Martin anymore. That really troubled him. So the first night he said to his dad, you know, this is really bothering me. And he says, and his dad said, let me tell you how it is. So he said to me in my dream, um, I think you're aware that this particular incident is one of the reasons why I became um, an activist in the way that I did throughout my life, wanting equality, equity, love, justice for, for all of us as Americans. It was his sort of version of a more perfect union. He also said to me that I, when you wake up, I want you to keep composing in the way that you do, doing music with children the way that you do, which is a very hands-on, organic um, process where in my music classes I gave kids many opportunities uh, with piano, ukulele, drums, um, guitar, um, instruments, which are different sizes of, let's just say, xylophones um, or marimbas. They have that kind of sound. Uh, so they had a lot of opportunity to compose. And so that's how I was instilling them when I got a chance to, to teach, although I do Love less it. now. Um, and, and so... I was going to say, so when I, he, he, when I woke up, you know, I had that on my mind. And so I'm moving forward with that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. How soon were you able to pick up the trumpet again? Oh, um, hmm. <laughs> uh, a number of months, because one of the things that happened is my lung stay partially collapsed for a, about an inch in each lung. Um, and, and so I remember going to the cardiologist about a year after the surgery, he goes, Oh, your lungs are fully functioning now. Um, and I would notice this, like when I would go to cardiac rehab and it was really cold outside and I, I would just like struggle to get through the parking lot. And, and once I was inside, I could do the treadmill, no problem, but, um, you know, just little things like that. But it did take a while for me to be able to play my horn because you need good breath. But I try to sing, and I mostly played the piano. So uh, have, have, um, here you are uh, recovering in your story. We're looking at your story. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering how those, that, those moments with encounters, how did they play into your recovery, do you think? I mean, I'm assuming that you're not crazy. I mean, and that I'm assuming also that these encounters, no. <laughs> these encounters are sub substantive uh, in some degree, some way. And, and I honor those. And I'm sure how, how, how did those continue to be um, a part of your recovery? Well, let me, let me start by telling you, giving you a little story, a little context. So when I was <clears throat> growing up, I moved to Washington, D.C. at the age of two and left at the age of 10. And so in 1963, when I was seven, I uh, just turned seven, Martin Luther King Jr. and company came to town. And I, I, I knew it was going to be a big deal. And I actually wanted to go down to the Lincoln Memorial and 
and take part in this. <laughs> well, my brother Craig was nine, my sister Carol was five, and my brother John was two. And my mom was home with us that day. She wasn't working at the church where she and my dad worked, but my dad was, and she's like, sorry, we can't ride the, the bus down to the end. I would like to go with you too. So she did turn it on, and she and I were the only ones that watched it. And I was captivated first by John Lewis, um, 23-year-old man who was, I thought, gave a very powerful, a seven-year-old boy hurt. You know, and I, I tear up a little bit when uh, sure. I think about that. And then Martin followed, of course, with his very famous I Have a Dream speech, which unfortunately gets used by people in different ways to justify their um, continued racism. Um, and I would say that I'm just trying to be as anti-racist as possible. And every day I learn new things about like that. So all my life, I carried, you know, that day with me and just growing up in the city there at the time mm -hmm. um, and all the things that Washington went through during those times. I and mean, then, of course, I remember the day um, that he was killed. And that was a hard day for me as a kid. Um, and I think a lot of people really. Um, didn't have to happen, but it did. So let's move um, into your, and so, yeah. Let's move into your composing story. Um, you ha had you composed before you had this <clears throat> art event? Um, so with children, we would do little melodies, basically nothing ever complicated, because I, I worked with elementary children. I taught about 20,000 children over a span of 40-ish years Wonderful. Um, at schools in yeah, D.C. and North Carolina um, and Arizona were the places. Um, and so, yeah, there was a lot of that or taking their melodies and, you know, helping the class hear them. There was always a time to hear them. So it was the, there was that. But, you know, arranging music is... Uh, something that takes time, and so it's not something at that point in time I had a lot of time for beyond what I was doing with uh, the school children. But when the hard thing happened, I, I tried to go back to teaching for three weeks. I was teaching uh, band and orchestra to a number of private schools in the area, um, uh, Virginia Beach all the way to Williamsburg. And we figured out after my surgery I should only stay on this, what we call the, this side of the peninsula. Um, and so my number of schools went from 13 down to seven, but I couldn't handle what I was too weak. So, um, I just continued with my recovery and started just playing the piano a lot and looking at my dad's music because he was a composer of sacred music. Um, and I have all his music and listening to a lot of his music. And then, um, Around the time uh, George Floyd was killed, um, <clears throat> I was at a good place in my recovery and I was playing my horn. So that event sort of, you know, it touched all of us in different ways. But I created the piece Lament, which was then followed by um, Lament um, Leads to Hope, and then the piece that we're going to hear shortly, Sounds of Love. And I think the version I just sent over is for uh, vibraphone and violin. That was the original version, but when Symphony City, the orchestra I volunteer with, played it this past May, uh, Becky and I, who's my arranger, she, she's the one with the orchestral arranging background from Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, she, she and I collaborate, of course, in all this, but she, she's the nuts and bolts to take my melodies and, and make them into orchestral or ensemble works. Of course, I have input, but, you know, she's the main person. So we had to quickly come up with a wind and French horn version for uh, Sounds of Love. So that, that really, those three movements, and I call it Ode to Breath, not only my breath, but the breath of countless people of color who have been killed um, by our systemic racism in this country. 
um, that's been around for 400 and what, 21 years now. And it actually came to our shores. The first enslaved people came to our shores in Hampton, Virginia, uh, which is now Monroe, an actual fort that was very active during um, the Civil War. President Lincoln even came there. It was a Union stronghold. And some of you may remember from your history, that's where the Virginian and the uh, Monitor, uh, our first sub, had a battle out in sort of the James River slash York River slash Chesapeake Bay, because it all sort of meets yeah. there. So that's really how that piece came to be. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to say to the to viewers that I've known Joseph for many years, and as a uh, as I was in pastoral relationship with him and his family, and friendship as well. And Joseph has always been, uh, since my knowing of him, a, a very socially, social justice conscious person. And so it was exciting for me to see him emerge from this critical event <laughs> with composing music for social justice that he do devoted to his passion. and. I'm wondering, Joseph, how it must feel to bring, integrate those two things, your passion for justice and love and peace and your love of music. What you, how, how is that as an elder? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very grateful to have breath to do it, to be honest. And, um, and so when I woke up, I was very clear that I needed to be more intentional uh, in my life with being a loving person. Um, I know I'm tearing up a little bit, but it's, it's that deep in me. And, and so Martin, Martin was right in what he said to me, you know, you keep climbing the mountain in the way that you do, and we all do that. And so that's the mountain of justice, love, peace, kindness, unconditional love more perfect union um that's how we get there um we'll get there the other way um and so actually another piece that was created uh, that came up in the picture was um good trouble so after john lewis died i was of course very touched by that and i began to sort of have the the bacchano the ave marie you know the one ave maria that one, roll around in my head and I started putting some John Lewis good trouble piece uh, words to it so what ended up happening with that piece is um, we have the sopranos and and altos singing um, and tenors and basses singing some of like those good trouble lines but also um, uh, there's a high soprano in the Ave Maria part and then the marimba does the Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba the Bach line, right? And I love the marimba. Um, I'm actually creating a marimba duet piece for something else. Becky and I are, I haven't come up with them yet, but it's in my head. So we hope that a choir will sing that someday. That'll be beautiful. And we're not sure Talk when. a little bit about Sound yeah. of Love. I'd like, to, I'd like to have that played soon, but that, that, give us some orientation about <clears throat> this piece, Sounds of Love. So Sounds of Love is the third movement to the Ode to Breath work. So you have Lament, Lament leads to Hope, Sounds of Love. So in the grieving process, there's always Lament. There's, you know, we're about things. I was about my heart. We were about what was going on in the country in 2020 or what's gone on for years. Or if you're a person of color, what's happened to you all your life in this country at different points along the way. Um, and so, you know, lament has to go somewhere. You can't always stay stuck in sadness if you're going to thrive, if, particularly, you know, at any age. And I wanted to thrive. So lament within a couple of days moved to lament leads to hope, um, which is actually played by the brass. It's a brass ensemble piece. Uh, no, no strings or percussion. And then from there, um, you know, you know, let's go to love because love acceptance is a place we all want to be in the grieving process. And I understand, you know, the grieving process, you go in and out of grief. But eventually, if you're going to come to terms with something, me, my own heart surgery, 
driving that, the racial injustices in this country, um, whatever it is, climate, whatever the, the concerns are, um, you know, we have to get to a point of acceptance and in order to keep moving forward. And so for this speech is about almost nine minutes long. Um, that was the resolution. We have uh, just a few minutes. Left. <clears throat> I'd love to play some, uh, have him play some of the um, sounds of love so the viewers can get a sense of the creativity that you drew upon and, and how it fleshed out at this, this side of your heart event. so mm -hmm. beautiful just so tender and, and thank I you my mm -hmm. viewers it's from joseph's heart to your heart thank you for mm -hmm. composing and moving from crisis to composing and uh <clears throat> and being an example of what it is to to be inspired and truly follow your bliss and your inspiration thanks so, so much for being with me here today joseph it's great to renew with you and those of you who are viewers, I want to welcome you to come back again in two weeks. Join with me again here at uh, Don't Just Age, Engage. And uh, let's make your elderhood a phenomenal and an extraordinary experience. Thanks, Joseph. Peace be with you all. Aloha.